opportunity. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Rolando Coradini. I'm the sales director for Middle East and Turkey for Embraer Commercial Aviation. Uh, thanks for the ECO and the Global Investment and Aviation Summit team for the invitation. So my goal here is to bring you some facts that will demonstrate the relevance of the regional and small narrow body aircraft to the aviation industry. From, by that, I intend to present you some examples on how airlines around the globe have been using, have been deploying the Embraer jets, and also to take the opportunity to present you Embraer and our line of products for the next generation aircraft. So, first, 2019 is a very important year to Embraer, and why? Because this year we celebrate 50 years old. We're actually older than Airbus, not many people know that. And last year, we had celebrated 50 years of the first flight of an ever-built Embraer aircraft, the Embraer 100, October 1968 in San Jose Campos, Brazil. Okay, so revenue breakdown. Embraer is actually composed of four business units, commercial aviation, executive aviation, defense and service and support. And commercial aviation is actually responsible for around 65% of the revenues. Forecast for 2019, 5.3 to 5.9 billion dollars in terms of revenue. And we are in rare. We are the only airplane manufacturer that within the 21st century had developed 15 different aircraft. We're talking about developing supply chain, uh, design tools, development process, human resources. This experience and knowledge is basically one design leveraging from the previous one. Commercial, military, uh, executive aviation. You find great examples that of aircraft have been, that have been, uh, been uh, a breakthrough in terms of technology, passenger services, and fulfilling different missions. Yes, come back. And by being able of, of deploying several applications and supporting different business models, we were able to build up a global footprint. So today, there are more than 1,700 Embraer aircraft flying around the globe in the colors of 100 jet operators in 60 countries, namely North, Central, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Middle East, Oceania, you will find examples of very traditional, respected airlines that fly an Embraer aircraft to support this their business model. And today, the Embraer jets, the E-jets, have a firm backlog of around 1,708, but actually these are numbers of third quarter 2018, as, as you can see there in the bottom line. Uh, and this will, of course, increase significantly, and we, are, we have very high expectations for our 2018 uh, numbers. Uh, basically, this number will grow around, uh, let's say, more than 100, around, around 150 aircraft. And there, you can look up, you have some examples of very respected airlines and leasing companies that have been supporting regional uh, and small middle body aircraft in the up to 150 seat segments. That's the segment that Embraer is the world market leader. And yes, that's the graph. So why up to the 150 seat segment? Because now the 195 e the next generation aircraft, has actually a capacity of up to 146 seats. So that uh, required Embraer to redefine its segment so today, yes, we are the market leader, the global market leader for aircraft up to 150 seats with 29% share of the users. And why regional and small narrow body aircraft? Many are the uses. And here I present you one example in the, of the Middle East region. So, 42% of the intra-regional flights are flown with a load factor lower than 70%. 42%, you can see the, the, the bars there, but adding up up to 
42% of the flights. This is basically the region, what we call the loss-making zone for narrow bodies. If you fly those routes with a narrow body, you're going to lose money. And this is the perfect uh, region, the perfect scenario for the operation of the regional and the small narrow bodies. So basically, you would find profitability in the same routes that today you find loss if you have been flying these uh, routes with a regional or with a small narrow body basically with the right capacity and that's what we call the right sizing finding the right aircraft for the segments that you intend to fly allowing you to make profit so as we were discussing several are the applications of Embraer jets that you find around the globe the first one we already discussed that's the right sizing so basically instead of flying an empty narrow body instead of flying metal you fly an aircraft that offers the right capacity for the demand that you uh, that you you will find in several segments big aircraft are great <coughs> if you're able to feel them hub feeding in this example you find all around the globe so it's basically finding the passengers in the smaller secondary markets uh, low range markets you bring these passengers to a hub and you distribute those passengers in longer haul, bigger aircraft. Market presence, so by offering the right capacity, airlines are able to offer higher frequency in the markets that they intend to explore. By offering higher frequency, they are able many times to stimulate the market and also strengthen its position against competition, so making its presence in the market uh, stronger and more relevant. And uh, profit hunting, so smaller aircraft, higher load factors. So basically by applying, applying the right capacity in the market that you fly, you increase your load factors and of course you increase profitability. And many of these lower demand markets you will find higher yields, basically because you can find less competition uh, with other airlines and maybe other modes of transport as well. So higher load factors, higher yields, and also by applying the right capacity, you reduce your trip cost. So basically, more uh, lower costs, more revenue, higher profitability. So let's give a few examples of how airlines around the globe have been using day jets. And I would like to start with KLM. KLM is one of the largest e jets operators in Europe. Uh, Lufthansa is the largest one if you aggregate all the airlines within the group, plus Helvetic that operates under uh, the brand of Swiss. So, but let's check on KLM City Hopper. On lower demand markets such as Amsterdam to Gdansk in Poland, on the left side, KOL, KOLM have been applying the right sizing and offering two frequencies for that market uh, around midday with a U190 and around 8 o'clock with a U175. With that, they are able to reach load factors as high as 86%. You increase the density and you go to markets such as Amsterdam, Brussels, also you will find a little bit more competition there. KLM have been applying the right sizing and also stimulating the demand and offering options, more options to passengers by offering more frequencies. So basically, five frequencies per day on Embraer jets, on the E-jets, E-190s and E-175s. And you increase even more the density and you find Amsterdam, Munich, also a very competitive <coughs> market. And here, the demand already justifies a narrow body, a bigger aircraft. And KLM have been using the E-Jet to complement the operation of the 737s. So basically, on the lower peak time, on the lower peak time, you apply the right capacity, you fly an Embraer jet, you reduce your cost, and you increase your profitability. Okay? Hub feeding, United, 
Today there are almost 200 aircraft flying on behalf of United in the US. And uh, this one is quite interesting. Did you know that in an average white body operation, United Airlines flight from the US to overseas, one every three passengers had flown, flown on the previous sector an Embraer jet. So basically, Embraer jets are being used by United on the hub feeding uh, model. So basically, you fly to secondary markets, smaller markets, lower range markets, you bring those passengers to hubs such as Chicago and Houston, and you distribute those passengers on longer, on longer haul flights. So basically, 35% of the passengers inside a United Airlines flight uh, from the US to overseas on a white body had been uh, flown on the previous sector and in red jet. If you look at routes such as uh, Frankfurt via Chicago, this number is as high as 44%, and Sao Paulo via Houston, 42%. Yes, new market opportunities and hub by pass. Okay, if you, if you check the share of passenger movements in the top two cities in Europe, for example, you find that this number is as high as 10%, 14% in the US, but you find other areas where this concentration of share movements is much higher. For example, in Russia, share of movements of airports uh, of Moscow and St. Petersburg reach numbers as high as 64%. S7 have seen the opportunity. So before the Embraer jets in 2016, they served, S7 served, out of Novosibirsk, 15 different cities. In 2018, with the right capacity, with the Embraer 170, they were able to almost triple that number. So now they are serving 43 <coughs> markets. And why? Because now they are using the right capacity that allows them to explore secondary smaller markets on a profitable way. So if you, che if you check the numbers of 2016, uh, for Novosibirsk to Ekaterinburg, uh, there were 100 daily passengers. By deploying the Embraer U-170s, the right capacity, they increased the frequency, they stimulated the market, almost doubling that number to 215 passengers and also increasing the service level because before, out of this 100, around 20 were connecting through Moscow. Now, the great majority, almost the totality of passengers are flying direct. And colorful Guangzhou in China. Uh, we talked about airport constraints in airports such as Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou. So colorful uh, Guangzhou is actually uh, decentralizing the operation towards countryside, so serving secondary markets to secondary markets. And the way to do it on a profitable way is by using an Embraer jet, the U-190s. So the U-190s, the right capacity, reduces the risk of opening a new business, of opening a new route. Also, the break-even is reached much earlier than bigger aircraft, and they're basically disrupting the status quo, allowing passengers to fly direct, increasing the service level that airlines are able to provide. And British Airways, another example in Europe, so they are using the e-jets in the shuttle services out of London City. So basically, on this very high yield market, because London City is located in the heart of London uh, and counts on a lot of business traffic. So yields are significantly uh, higher or very high compared to other markets. And by using the e-jets, they are able to serve different markets with seven, with four to up to seven uh, daily frequencies. So, as a matter of fact, the U-190 is the most used aircraft in, in flights out of London City. Uh, there are eight airlines flying uh, routes out of London City, KLM, Lufthansa, British Airways, 
Alitalia, Hop on behalf of Air France, Helvetic on behalf of Swiss, Eastern and North Polish. Every five minutes, one India takes off out of London City. And we talked about the fact that Embraer today is a leader, is the market leader in a segment of up to 150 seats. And of course, we intend to keep this leadership. How? With the EJET C2. This is our next generation clean sheet design aircraft. <laughs> clean sheet design aircraft. The leverages from all the experience gathered with Embraer at previous programs, especially the EJETs current EJETs, the EJETs E1. The EJETs E1 had, get, had gathered until today more than 24 million flight hours and all the lessons learned and intensive customer, inter uh, customer interaction with airlines all around the globe supporting different business models empowered Embraer to develop a very mature uh, new clean sheet design aircraft with the best of the technologies. New avionics, new fuselage, new material, new wings, New engines, 75% of the systems are completely new. New landing gear, fourth generation full fly by wire, you name it, we applied here the best you can find in terms of technology and aviation today. Here a picture of the cockpit. Uh, basically, what you see in a 787, you see in the cockpit of the A2. The best state of art avionics and something that we are very proud of the fourth generation full fly by wire system. It's not the first time that uh, we had designed a full fly by wire system. Uh, we started with a fly by wire in the E-Jets, then we came already full fly by wire in the Legacy 450 and 500, the KC-390, the military jet, and the E-Jet C2, fourth generation. The experience, by knowing that, uh, how to do it, and by doing that you know, in previous times, in repeated times, you're able to take the full capacity, full advantage of such a system. One of them, for example, is to reduce fuel burn. And the U-92 is exceeding all targets in terms of certification, transition timing, so if a pilot flies the U-1, so it takes two and a half days, no full flight simulator for the pilots to start, to start flying the next generation E-2s, fuel burn exceeding all the targets, setting benchmark in terms of maintenance intervals, and yes, we are the quietest aircraft in the segment, both external noise and internal noise. And we have numbers uh, to back up that fact. Today, four E-Jets in the family, 170, 175, 190, 195. The E-Jets E-2, three aircraft, E-175, E-2, eight seats in a dual-class configuration. E190, E297 seats in a dual class configuration, up to 195, E2, 120 seats in a dual class configuration. So maximum flexibility from 80 to 146 seats in a balanced capacity distribution. A lot of flexibility in terms of capacity and the perfect family to complement, for example, the operations of a 737. In terms of fuel burn, Comparing the current generation and the new generation, numbers go as high as 24% per seat. E195, E2 versus the E190. E195, E2 is increasing in three rows compared to the E195. The E195, E2 versus the E190, 17.3% fuel burn reduction per seat or per trip because those aircraft have the same capacity. Compared to the competition, and here we bring the comparison of the e jet 2 versus the A220, the former CS uh, family. And the fuel burn advantage of the E2s is as high as 10%. And we have all the technical facts, aerodynamics and weight, for example, to justify that fact. And here, a range out of Dubai. So basically, a EU-92 can fly almost 3,000 nautical miles in a dual-class configuration, basically six to seven hours of flight. And you can cover some of the major markets out of Dubai, India, uh, Central Asia, East Africa, Europe, Middle East. 
And the assumptions they are not marketing, okay? They are quite realistic. We intend not to disappoint customers when you present slides, even an expectation that cannot be fulfilled. So these are actual numbers, actual assumptions that we get from different airlines around the world. In terms of uh, maintenance, as previously discussed, we set the benchmark in terms of maintenance intervals with day jets. We have day jets E1, 24 million flight hours of data. We have a real understanding of the aircraft and its, uh, and, and its ground where it's operated. So that allowed us to certify already from the to, to approve already from the entry to service longer intervals. Compared, for example, to an 8020 uh, or a 737 or an 8320, these longer intervals will actually mean less visits to hangar and low maintenance cost therefore highest availability. In terms of interior, with the E-Jets we already set the benchmark. Many airlines that fly E-Jets and other narrow body aircraft in their fleet, that they have those aircraft in their fleet, passengers systematically as in surveys, they define the, the cabin of the E-Jets as being more comfortable. So the no middle seat concept is there, so passengers will sit either in the aisle or in the window. And this allows as well faster turnaround times, resulting in better on-time performance. Also, every passenger in the cabin will find a place in the overhead bin. The overhead bins, they increased in size without taking the, the space of the passengers. So a lot of engineering happened in the back Ground in the back of the overhead bin. One bag per passenger, maximum IATA standard, wheels first. Also, on the top of that, so bringing the number to an even higher number of one bag per passenger, around 1.3 to 1.4 bags per passenger, is the space under the seat that is completely unobstructed. So under each double seat, you're also able to fit a leg. And many, several are the features that we are bringing to the cockpit, to, to the cabin, sorry. For example, individual passenger units. So passengers will not invade the space of each other. For example, to increase the flow of air conditioning or to turn on the light. Connected cabin management systems allowing cabin crew to receive and send messages uh, while in flight. And also establish integration with the pilot's electronic flight deck. Uh, mood light larger window frames, giving the, percep the perceptions to the passengers of a much larger window. Uh, integrated overhead beam doors design. So basically, the overhead beams of the EJS, the doors open up. The beams do not come down, the doors open up. So the overhead beams, when they are open, or during the transition, they, when they are opening, they will not uh, disturb the, 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 the boarding or the planning. Easy access to power outlets, touchless kits, and more. We also bring the staggered concept to the cabin. So the same concept that you find in the white bodies, the staggered seats, you bring to the cabin of the E-Jets each group. Once again, we are the quietest family uh, in, of the segment, both external noise and cabin noise. Numbers for cabin noise, they can be considered as quite incredible when they are compared to the E-Jets, when we compare the E-Jets C2s with the, with the C-Series, with the A220s. The E-1s, they are already more silent than the A220s, and the E-2s are more silent than the E-1s. In terms of timeline, we are able to certify the E-Jet C2, the E192, the first member of the family, on time, on budget, and exceeding the specs. This is quite rare when you talk about aircraft development all around the industry. We promise an aircraft being certified and reaching the market in the first half of 2018, and we deliver them. To the end of the year, we'll have the E195 E2 already delivered and entering into service. Azul Airlines in Brazil is the first EJET uh, E195 E2 operator, E175 E2 until 2021. Video Airlines was the first airline to fly an Embraer E192 in commercial services. The operation 
is very mature. So by applying all the experience that we get with the quality jets on our design, we brought to the market a mature aircraft. And actually we had Andrea Ax, the C C CEO of Vidro uh, last week in Dublin giving a, a lecture to the entire Embraer sales force and we got very uh, pleased and actually a little bit emotional uh, by hearing his words and uh, him directly from, we, from him, the responsible of, of, for the entry to sales of the Embraer jets in Videro, how the product is mature, how the product is delivering and how Embraer as an entire organization was able to answer uh, to Videro's uh, request. Azul Airlines in Brazil, the biggest operator of the U-195, is the launch customer of the U-195E2. Everything, all the action shall happen this year. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity once again. And if you have any questions, if we have time for questions. Yes, absolutely. That's why I was asking you to finish a little bit. So we have time for questions. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Gabriel Sanchez here. Just uh, two questions, actually. Um, can you please give us an update regarding the partnership or joint venture with Boeing? And second question also related to that. How do you see the impact of your tied up with Boeing on yourselves? Okay. Um, I, th I think that we are close to see something that has no parallel in history of aviation. And I hope my Boeing colleague we will confirm that. We have the world leader in the segment up to 150 seats joining forces in a joint venture with the world leader in aviation. So the two companies, they offer capacities that complement perfectly each other. So this joint venture will be able to provide to airlines options that go from 70 seats up to 450 seats on a very balanced, equilibrated distribution in terms of capacity. There are no overlaps. The U175E2, U192, and U195E2 will perfectly complement the Boeing portfolio of products today. Also, Embraer will be able to bring to this joint venture an incredible engineering force. We're talking about 5,000 engineers, top level engineers, and like we discussed in the beginning of the presentation, 50 years of experience in aircraft development and certification. Regarding sales, and I find that a quite an interesting uh, uh, question, uh, that will definitely boost our sales. And why? Because basically we will have an access to airlines that today we don't have. So basically, Boeing in this joint venture, we allow Embraer aircraft to be offered to a wider, a much wider range of airlines uh, around the globe. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. We have a second question from this. No? Yes. Hello, sir. I have a question about fuel burn reduce. You said. Uh, your aircraft reduces fuel burn up to 24% compared to which aircraft? In this comparison here we bring the A195 as it is today, the A195E1 versus the A195E2. So the two aircraft, the A195 with up to 124 seats and the A195E2 with up to 146 seats on a high density configuration. So comparing to those aircraft, actually bringing the same service level to the cabin. So comparing 120 to around 132 seats on the 195 e 2 you take the fuel burn per seat, <coughs> sorry, to a, to a delta of around 24%, but this number will actually increase because 24% was our, our estimate before the 195 e 2 went to flight test campaign. The flight test campaign is coming to an end, and the new numbers will actually increase that difference. If we talk about a fuel burn per trip, then the number is around 17 to 18%. The 195 versus the 195 e 2 Okay? 
you give some more crash questions. Dear guests, don't forget to introduce yourself to this. Stephen Lyons of Silver. Could you just tell us a little bit about the financial support that's available uh, for the Embraer aircraft through the NPS or the, uh, the, the Export Credit Agency? Yeah, BNDS has been a great partner for Embraer since the beginning. They are there, of course, to stimulate uh, the exports of companies in Brazil. And Embraer is definitely one of the companies that are that receive the, the support for financial solutions by the, our development bank, the BNDS. But as a matter of fact, uh, Embraer has been in the market for quite a long time already. In the EJC2, believe it or not, they are considered as a very liquid asset. And we are talking about the EJC being compared to the 737s to the A320s. So along the years, we are able to develop uh, good relationships with uh, banks, other banks, uh, investors, financial institutions that are also participating in deals. Also today, uh, just agreeing on the numbers that were presented in the previous presentation, around 30 to 40 percent of the Embraer fleet is actually leased, and we have great names in the leasing community backing up the operation of the e-jets. Uh, examples: NAC, the fifth largest uh, leasing company, has around, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 150 plus e-jets in their portfolio. We have also GCAS. We have Azura, Falco, so great names in the leasing community supporting the operation of the E2, sorry, the E1s. And on the E2 sides, speculative orders from Aircap, and actually the almost entirely uh, fleet of Aircap had already been placed. We also have ICBC, and we have Aircastle with speculative orders for E2s. Thank you, Thank you very much. I wanted to finish, but okay. Uh, from what I saw in the graph, you, you had the range of the aircraft, and you said it was around six, six hours uh, range. But from what I saw, it's, it's, it's a four hour or 4.5 hour range on an Airbus narrow body. But uh, now I was wondering on the max speed of the aircraft, the cruising speed, and what's the effect if it took longer for the Embraer uh, in terms of fuel consumption compared to the Airbus, or is it going to take shorter? Sure. Uh, the optimum speed of the aircraft, of course, will vary depending on the operation. The long range cruise of the E jets, E2, they increased compared to the current E jets. The long range cruise is a speed that brings you some, some good leverage in terms of fuel burn and flight time and had been uh, chosen by airlines and actually had been presented by manufacturers since many, many years. So taking the reference to long-range cruise, you won't find any difference between the long-range cruise of an Airbus, uh, A320, Airbus 737, or an EJC2. So uh, keeping the answer short, uh, the EJC2 will comply with the emissions in the same, absolutely the same time as a 737 or an A320. The altitude ceiling, just as a reference, is 41,000 feet, and the maximum speed is uh, 0.82 of mile. So, uh, those, those, uh, the maximum range of the aircraft is about six to seven hours. That's quite extreme. With the HLC2, we already have routes as long as almost six hours, four point, five point something. Uh, Copper Airlines is the airline that flies from Central America, if I'm not mistaken, to the US. Could be wrong, but the, rain, the, the, the flight time is about that. Thank you very much. I'll just give you a bit of background uh, to me. Um, one of the points that we're discussing today is investing in aircraft. And I actually, from all the people that have been speaking today, that is our responsibility at Boeing Capital Corporation. We delivered just over 800 aircraft last year in the commercial space and it's our role as Boeing Commercial Credit and Boeing Capital Corporation to actually ensure that every single one of our aircraft has a financing against it. So when the aircraft gets delivered, there's financing available. One of the nice things that we're going to discuss today 
is that the breadth and opportunity for people to invest in aircraft has grown dramatically. And I think some of the information that you've seen today, particularly from Eddie and Peter, is how regulated this industry is. The amount of data that is actually present and has been presented today compared to other industries, and I'm, I'm a structured financier, I'm a banker originally, there are very few industries that give you this kind of quality of information, up to date and very specific. Now if you're turning that to being an investor, that's what you want, data points. Now a number of you will have come back from Dublin a couple of days ago, there was a 6,000 person event in Dublin. This is generally aircraft financiers. Now if I wind the clock back 15 years, aircraft financing was just a niche market done by specialist people. It wasn't very mainstream. And actually every time you talk about aircraft financing, people talk about airlines. I'm not talking about airlines, I'm talking about aircraft. And that's a big difference. And I think that's one of the things today that when we debate this, and I think Peter put it quite eloquently, we can move aircraft, we can pick them up, we can reconfigure them, and we can move them to a different jurisdiction. You know, for me, this is mobile real estate. And as everything changes in certain markets, and we've seen how the real estate market has changed, particularly in retail. This is an asset class that needs to be taken very seriously. And I think when we look at the numbers that we've got coming up, and that was already highlighted before, again, lots of data points, about $126 billion of aircraft last year. This year, we're about $143 billion. By 2023, probably about 180 billion. We've got plenty of aircraft to finance. So as a collateral, we've got a lot of opportunity. And one of the things that I want to sort of cover today is how do you select where you should be in that capital structure? And actually, I'll turn it on its head. Maybe you don't select the aircraft, maybe through your own institutional view, the aircraft effectively picked you rather than the other way around. So as a context, we've seen, and, and I think a lot of the data points that were shown earlier on, which were really you know, tremendously valuable for us to say, okay, we have an in-service fleet of well over 20,000 aircraft. Boeing and Airbus on their own delivered 1,600 aircraft last year, of which around 1,200 stuck within the overall fleet. So there were retirements, and we'll talk about that later on as we get into the collateral. But you can see each year, the aircraft fleet is growing. So we're in a much more diverse, wider pool. And a lot of that's come from Asia, and we know that. But that's showing the demographics. Now we've also said one of the things, and we've got to debate that as we get into the coming slides, is looking at that collateral. There are very few collaterals that have this kind of longevity. 25 years, maybe in some instances coming down, I think Eddie had said the same, it sort of ebbs and flows, but generally 25 years is the considered norm. You have an industry where consumers are spending a trillion dollars on aircraft travel. The fuel bill alone for the airlines is going to be $200 billion this year. These numbers are huge, and I think it was shown earlier on as well, and I think that's quite important. Just to have a look at how much the, the whole cycle stays above world GDP. It used to be very closely correlated, but I have to say the aviation market has kept itself slightly ahead. So we also look and say, well, how much has the investor base changed? Ten years ago, there were about 106 leasing companies. There's 153 leasing companies today. So you can already see that people want 
to be in this market. Now, leasing companies are true asset managers. And that's something we're going to come on in a second. As we say, how do you invest in aircraft? Why do you invest in aircraft? You have to find where you have an understanding of your position within the capital structure. Okay. We're going to keep this very simple because aircraft financing actually is a relatively simple class. But don't overstep your capability level. The areas that we're looking at here generally, credit, you look at the aircraft, and you need to look at the jurisdiction. And we'll run on to those, each one separately. Once you have that understanding and you actually have your own indigenous capability matrix, and I worked many years ago for GE Capital, these guys used to love equipment. That's what they understood, probably more than credit. So if you have that understanding, you'll soon understand where you fit within the credit structure. This is all straightforward. This is just credit assessment, okay? So from a very, very pure basis, any credit and risk team will make that assessment for you. The most important thing is though, institutionally, where do you sit in the capital stack? Are you a senior lender? Are you a junior lender? Would you put equity in? You'll have heard some of you, Jolcos, Japanese operating lease companies. These guys have been putting in equity, tax equity, for many, many years. And in fact, we're still seeing a huge, huge drive. They are very capital efficient structures. And this is tax equity, so you are at risk when you put that funding into a deal. But you have to understand where you are within that capital piece. Do not start investing if you're not comfortable. If you're not an asset manager, and I think there were some of the points that Eddie brought up, then you better bring in someone who has that collateral expertise. Don't try and do it yourself. You will make a mistake. An aircraft, for as simple as I said it is, to finance. When an aircraft is grounded and you have to start fixing it, the bills are fairly significant. But that can all be mitigated. The other areas there that I would like to look at. The last point, mitigating factors. We've seen new products come into the market. We'll give you credit enhancements. There's a product called AFIT. It's the Aviation Finance Insurance Consortium. Last year, this business has only been operating for two years, they financed 28 aircraft, about $2.2 billion, almost from a standing start. And they will provide a credit wrap for your risk. So again, you have to have a look, where do you feel comfortable in that capital structure? And how do you need to support yourself incrementally? Okay, I think this has been discussed quite extensively with regard to performance capability. You know, we've seen that is a very critical facet. And as you start to move from credit to asset, these are the areas that you're going to define. Now, we had a very good question about should you invest in technology? Yes, the efficiencies that drive the business model, and you've seen how much the, the airlines save per year on fuel costs have been tremendous. But not everyone wants to be in that space. There are people who actually like to be at the end of an aircraft life cycle because they will part out the aircraft. They'll break it up. They'll take the value of the engines. They'll just take the aircraft, strip it right back, and they'll sell it. Now, those people are specialists. I wouldn't recommend if you're an early starter in aircraft financing, you start moving into that area, you need to know a lot more before you get into that. And you've got to understand the stub risk. Is anyone taking a residual value in a transaction? Because at the end of the day, you've always got to be careful 
about how are you going to redeploy that aircraft. Certain assets are more difficult to redeploy. We've heard from Embraer, you know, there is a liquidity, and that is something that's very important to look at. Today, it's an all-time low in terms of how many aircraft are actually parked in the desert, as they call it. Five percent, probably, of the global fleet is currently parked, about a thousand aircraft. That is an all-time low. So when you're doing your assessments of do I want to invest in this kind of asset class, where is it in its life cycle? Is it quite late? We saw the A350 and I think Peter gave a good view. It's, it's only just been launched. So it's very cutting edge, leading edge. Same as the 7A product. Cutting edge, you know, these are aircraft that are going to have a long life cycle. Some of the older aircraft, they still have a very ubiquitous use. And, you know, we have to look at some of the regions that these aircraft are going to be used in as well. So when you are also making your assessment, you're going to do things about environmental damage to the aircraft. In this region, pretty tough, right? Because hot, sand, engine blades wear out quicker. So again, some of the comments that were made um, by Peter, which were very valuable, which is, you know, where are you also in your reserves? You have to have your maintenance spot on, otherwise that will cost you a lot of money. En engine overhauls, up to $10 million per engine on a big engine. So you get that wrong, you have a problem. We at Boeing, we've got a program now where we're taking all the aircraft out and we're converting them to freighters. So again, look at the type of collateral. Is there a secondary market? Where is the secondary market? Now, this is something very important. It's probably not the most interesting of aspects because it's fairly heavily regulatory focused. But Cape Town is important. Cape Town precedes any national law. This is for the recovery of your aircraft. 73 countries have signed up to Cape Town, 29 have fully ratified it. What does the difference make? In 2012, Kingfisher Airlines went into bankruptcy. It was taking lessors over 180 days to get their aircraft out. That's your money. That is an asset that should be redeployed, released, rehired, whatever. It's sitting there, it's not moving. Come to 2015, SpiceJet had some incidents. The lessors, again, some of them decided to take action. With the Cape Town Convention, they were able to exercise their ability to recover in 80 days compared to the over 180 days. This is your money. You're investing in asset class. You have to be able to protect it. It is important to be able to have the visibility about how that aircraft can be re being recovered. Now, what are the areas that, as I look at, as we piece all this together, make sure you understand what kind of structure you're getting into from a financing. Don't do something that is so complex that you can never flip it. A lot of these lessors and financiers will cycle their books, which is an important thing to do. You keep your portfolio churning, you sell them out, the money comes back in, you reinvest. Don't do a structure that is so complicated that you don't understand it. Because if you can't understand it, neither will anyone else. So when you try to move it on, you'll have some risk. Look at those returns. I think we had a lot of conversation. Very ubiquitous, narrow body aircraft command very low yields. Now that's okay if you are in that kind of model 
where you value credit risk and you value low volatility. But the yields will be lower. So let's be candid about it. As you take more risk, jurisdictionally, asset class, credit, that is going to give you the benefit of an uptick in your returns. Everything, when you're picking an aircraft, this whole model has to work as one. So there's no getting away from doing your homework. The collateral is important. But those two pillars either side, jurisdictionally and credit-wise, you have to get right. Now, one of the big risks that I see coming down the line, one of the areas, and I look after Middle East and Africa, jurisdictionally, it is tough in these emerging markets. A lot of investors don't want to go into higher risk jurisdictions, and we know that there have been incidents in the past where certain banks have lost money, lessors have lost money. From my perspective, if you have a diversified portfolio, there is always going to be some room for risk management, risk tolerance. And I think that's going to be very important as we go into 2019, 2020 and beyond. I look at Africa with a population of 1.1 billion. And I think some of the focus that Peter brought up, the UAE has done a phenomenal job about focusing on the aviation sector. 35%, I think, of the GDP by about 2030 of Dubai is going to come from aviation. I look at a country like Ethiopia, where they have focused a massive amount of energy on their airline. Huge, huge growth and a huge airline, I have to say. One of the areas we've got to look at as an investor community is continuing to invest in those growth and emerging markets. It is a challenge. There are ways of mitigating risk. Certainly at Boeing Capital, we're always trying to be as creative as we can be. We've started up a mezzanine fund in the UAE called CEDA. So we will always constantly try and develop alternatives. And there is a point where you can invest in everything. Whether you want to be senior, junior, mayors, you can invest in a lessor, you can invest in a debt fund, you can invest in an equity fund. The key for me is that you are looking as broadly as you can and you have a diversified portfolio. Thank you.